Recently, we sat down with Dr. Richard Olm. Rich Olm is a chiropractor who specializes in treating and working with strength and power athletes. In this episode, we discuss some of Rich's background as a strength and power athlete, as well as some of the variables associated with injury in these athletic populations. I hope you enjoy my talk with Dr. Richard Olm. So throughout this, you got into high level training, you experienced a couple of injuries yourself, and that really made you dive into biomechanics, strength training, conditioning, et cetera. And throughout your schooling, uh, which included, you know, 1200 hours in the anatomy lab, things like that, you really were looking at through the lens of how do I make these athletes better? That was kind of the getting athletes to improve and performance was what got me interested in the medical field. It wasn't an injury. Oh, okay. So I got injured when I was an athlete. Most of my injuries didn't come to roost until after I retired. So I missed zero training days in 15 years of training. Um, and it wasn't until after that lots of things that I was doing with my back that I'm sure we'll get into because there's a lot of preventative things that I could have done. Um, that I know now, but I didn't, it wasn't the injury that got me into it. I was just because of working with those athletes, training alongside them. I wasn't coaching them at that point. I was just fascinated with the human body. And I was, I got into chiropractic because way back, you know, this is 2005, 2006, there wasn't a huge internet presence of Gray Cooks and, you know, Quinn Hennocks and, you know, just good people that are putting out nice content you know, their OPEX is another really, really good one that puts out great content that, that didn't exist. And I'm just even to a fault obsessed with understanding things to their smallest detail. Um, <clears throat> and so I decided, oh, heck, well, I'll just go back to school. And that's where I can dig into the anatomy, the neurology and the mechanics and all that kind of stuff. And then that's just how my brain works. So my, my brain is very mechanical. And so in the beginning, it was, all right, I need to study biomechanics and understand that language fluently. And I also need to know anatomy cold. I need to know where every origin insertion is, every direction of pull. And I need to understand in what position, in every different position, what would each muscle do? Um, so that was a cool thing to go through in the beginning, but then as we'll probably dive into here, it turns out neurology is really more driving the system. So the, the biomechanics based understanding of the body while I was trying to learn about this stuff eventually sort of became a neurological based understanding of movement and function. And one thing that you always key into, and we've, I've heard you riff on research and things like that before. Uh, I really want to key into one the injuries that you did experience, they didn't come to roost immediately. No. So if I was a researcher and I was following your team, following your group for one season, would I have picked up those injuries? No, 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 no. I mean, I, I got my in, it was in uh, 1997. I was doing pyramid squatting and I had 365 in the bar and I think I was supposed to do a set of three. And at the bottom of the second rep, I felt my, the right side of my back get tight um, nothing into my hips, nothing into my hamstrings, legs, nothing like that, just really tight. And I felt like, oh, it feels like the ligaments got really tight. Uh, what that was is that was my first disc herniation. And so I had pretty bad, I wasn't antalgic, but I, I could not, you know, tie my shoes without sitting down or laying on my back. Um, I, you know, like an idiot, I just trained right through it, just started throwing the belt and, you know, I didn't, wasn't getting a whole lot of help from the athletic training room. And just because of my youth, I was able to just sort of like muscle through it and go. And then that later on, you know, just with all the training and the, all the, the hinging and the squatting and the throwing that just over time beat it up. And then I eventually, you know, beat up the, the, the subsequent, the next two levels above it. Mm -hmm. And it was really must've been, I was in my late thirties when I really started when I had some, some issues actually got drop foot for a little while, which is not good. Um, and that's kind of what officially sidelined me for sidelined sidelined me from doing barbell stuff. 
So I love barbell movements. Um, my eyes will literally water up if I think about it too long because it was one of my favorite things to do, snatches and clean and jerks and squatting. And I will squat a little bit here and there. I'm, we can talk about preventative stuff and, and what I've modified in my training. And these mm-hmm. are actually things that I, I think would benefit you know current athletes and current strength yeah. coaches. I think there's a paradigm shift that needs to happen because the, the way that we do it now – somewhat is is riddled and driven by tradition and i think there's a lot of change that can be made that could could go into prevention i agree and i agree with that on all levels of from athletes to coaches to healthcare providers that i think that paradigm shift does need to happen because i've used some of the techniques from the prog school and that you've taught me literally on regular people that have gotten injured in physical training have gotten injured at crossfit and I can say they work, you know? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, you know, we'll, we'll definitely dive into what is stabilization or what does bracing look like. There's lots of strategies that we can, we can kind of cover a little bit. But bracing correctly and stabilizing correctly has a profound effect on injury prevention, particularly the low back, although I could argue all the way up, up and down the whole chain. Um, and it also helps with performance. So yeah. a lot of times when I'm teaching someone to stabilize correctly, they'll just go into the weight room. I mean, literally, I had this happen um, when I was – last weekend I was teaching in Kansas City when you were yeah. there. I had a student that took the DNS weightlifting class or strength training class mm-hmm. at the UFC uh, headquarters in, in Vegas two weeks ago. And he came up to me and he goes, hey, dude, um, I literally – PR to my deadlift by 50 pounds. And it's the first time I've deadlifted or squatted in, I think he said seven years with no pain. Wow. And it was just going over the stuff that we covered in that course. And the, the main thing I want people to understand in that course is, you know, how to stabilize correctly. So mm-hmm. we dig into the mechanics of it, of course, the anatomy, but it's really, how do you teach it? How do you do it on yourself? And then how do you train it? And he instantly you know, added 50 pounds. There's no neurological adaptation or hypertrophy that happened yeah. in two weeks. Yeah. Well, some neurological happened and a microscopic amount of hypertrophy happened, yeah. but um, that change can only be explained by improving his spinal stiffness mm-hmm. so he could transfer more force from the, his legs into the bar. Do you feel like knowing some of the stuff that you know now, you could have prevented some of the injuries that you had when you were in your 30s? Whole heart, yeah, for sure. I mean, hundred percent. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm do, what I'm doing now, like this, the, the, just today, it was a fun one because I was at six thousand feet. Uh, I'm training for a famous, you know, kettlebell test or whatever that you do for strong first, which is came up by Pavel Tatsuin, I think it's how you pronounce it. Um, it's a hundred single arm swings in five minutes, and then you rest a minute. And you do ten Turkish get ups in ten minutes, and it's with a one hundred six, so it's with a forty eight kilo bell. Um, and today I did a, I did 117 swings, single arm with the 97 pound bell with zero back tightness, not even back pain, back tightness. And if I go all the way back to my days at Ashland, every single time I trained lower body, my back would get sore later that day or the next day for sure. And even stiff. I associated that with delayed onset muscle soreness. That wasn't what was going on. Um, what I know now is that that was just the discs were very aggravated and it was expressing itself or it was manifesting in these trigger points in my spinal extensors and QL and glutes and things like that. And so it was unbelievably painful to foam roll my glutes because they're sort of like a, a good indicator of the overall health status of the back. Um, and then... I would just always get tight. Now, you know, I'll go and, you know, sometimes I'll do 200 swings with a, with a heavy 97 right now. And then I'll do like 120 snatches with a 53. I mean, five years ago, that would literally put me in the hospital. And now because just I'm bullheaded, I guess, and I refuse to give up strength training. And I took what I, what I learned from Pavel Kolaj you know, Paul Hodges and some other people about stabilization. And then I applied it with, you know, all right, well, what do I know about anatomy? What do I know about strength mm-hmm. training? And then I'm lucky enough. I think the only thing that got me anything in sports is I'm, I can feel my body well. So I can, I can really feel if you mix the mechanics with what I can feel, I've, I really feel like I've been able to figure out some subtle nuance that has a significant impact on the, 
efficacy or the the safety of how you're stabilizing yeah. like you can brace with pressure in the belly that we'll obviously dig into mm -hmm. but you can also do it in ways that aren't optimal and i've i've because my back is so sensitive yeah. to movement force and different bracing strategies i can feel when it's not right and i can feel when it is right did you use a weight belt during any of that stuff today none no yeah. i don't use weight belts anymore yeah so now i'm only i mean you know Actually, I don't use weight belts when I squat. But I mean, truth be told, like the 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 movement that is the hardest is Olympic, like like hang cleaning and hang snatching, mm -hmm. Cy barbell cycling. That's the that is the hardest thing. We can get into why if you want later on. Um, but I can squat now. I I bias the front squat now. So if mm -hmm. I'm gonna squat, I used to be a high bar back squatter. Uh, and we did, I would say guessing five to one ratio of, of, of back squat to front squat, I would now flip that and be doing much more front loaded squats because it just keeps the spine in a better position. More axial load, less shear stress, et cetera. Yep. So it allows you to brace better. You are going to get um, the spine is lining up better. There's not as much flexion moment or uh, bending torque. Uh, that you have to resist against. So you're not going to lose it into rounded over or flexion. Mm -hmm. You're also not going to overcompensate and crank your spinal extensors on, um, which is we'll definitely dig into, which I call an extension compression stabilizing strategy, which is just ubiquitous in the strength training yeah. world. And it causes all kinds of movement dysfunction and directly affects, you know, injury. So, yeah, I read those DNS weightlifting notes. I went all into the physics before the course, and then you expertly explained them. So if anybody's looking for a pretty sweet course, DNS weightlifting, your We're strength training now. So it was oh, weightlifting, okay, and then DNS strength training, we've expanded it. So now it's three courses. So instead of trying to jam five days of material into three days, mm -hmm. um, we've expanded what we're covering, and now it's actually nine days of material. And the goal is to get someone to, you know, just fully master the ability to coach movement and identify dysfunction and, and integrate DNS with strength training movements. And one thing that, you know, many people have keyed into is that if you're trying to maximize how much you're pulling in something like a deadlift or many of those Olympic weightlifts is we don't want full flexion in the spine or rounding of the back when we're doing those lifts. So you would, you would probably agree that's the primary thing that we want to avoid and try to shoot for neutral. However, sometimes we overshoot that and we overly extend in the back. Yep. And this is what you've keyed into as the extension compression stabilizing strategy. Yeah, that's correct? just a mechanics way of explaining. I, mean, I got to give credit where credit is due. So I learned that postural syndrome, right? That compensatory strategy first from Vladimir Yanda. It's called lower cross syndrome. And that's kind of appreciates a consistent pattern where the abdominal wall and the glutes get inhibited and then the spinal extensors and the hip flexors become hyperactive. That's lower cross syndrome. Mm -hmm. You then have Pavel Kolaj, who refers to that same pattern as open scissor syndrome. Yep. That's just appreciating the oblique orientation of the diaphragm and the pelvic floor if you're to look at the, the body from the side, so in the sagittal plane. Um, and then you also have uh, Ron Hrushka from Postural Restoration Institute, PRI. He calls that uh, the PEC, so I think it's posterior extensor chain. I'm not, ex I'm not hundred percent sure on that, but I think it's posterior extensor chain. And that's a very, very similar pattern. There's, a, there's subtle differences between them, but really mm -hmm. they're all describing the same pattern. And that is the, the brain is using hyperactivity of the spinal extensors, which is bringing the spine into hyperlordosis, extending and compressing the spine. So just being a mechanics geek and liking or needing to understand the forces that are at work the forces that are affecting the spine are extension and compression and that there's all kinds of injuries that come directly from that. Mm -hmm. And there's injuries that come indirectly because it blocks optimal movement as well. Or come later on, right? Yeah. I mean, so it's an interesting one. The, my issue, I, mean, I have, I had, I still have it, but it's suppressed. Like I don't, now when I lift, my back doesn't get tight. And if mm -hmm. you're stabilizing correctly and stabilizing correctly is you're going to be maximally leveraging what I call the primary muscles of stabilization. And you want to use the other muscles or what I call accessory muscles of stabilization as little as possible. So the primary muscles are the diaphragm, the abdominal wall, which is made up of the transverse abdominus, the external oblique, and the internal oblique, and then the pelvic floor. And those create this canister, and they're, they're this very, very 
you know, deep inner core, so to speak. That's how Pavel, or, sorry, um, Paul Hodges calls it the inner core. So I call those the primary muscles of stabilization. If you stabilize well or properly, you're maximally leveraging those by not only the forces that they're creating, but they also create intra-abdominal pressure, mm-hmm. which the actual definition of intra-abdominal pressure is, is it is the summation of mechanical forces created by the diaphragm and opposing torso muscles. Great. But the way that I want coaches and, and clinicians to think about it is the intra-abdominal pressure is an outward pushing force in the belly. Mm-hmm. Now, that's only half the equation, but if you can't feel the presence of an outward pushing force, that means the diaphragm is not involved. And if the diaphragm isn't involved, there's no pressure, right? So my favorite line whatsoever about stabilization comes from Paul Hodges. Um, he's infamously was the guy that was doing research on the transverse abdominis that unfortunately sort of opened up this decade of everybody drawing their belly in and pulling their, their um, belly button towards their spine. Which you'll never see in a high level no one would naturally do that no you wouldn't see it in a baby it would even feel awkward to do if you just went to pick up like a heavy cooler filled with ice yeah your natural um sensations to push out that's contract the diaphragm but nonetheless he researched it and he's a brilliant researcher maybe the best there is and it is it does decrease pain in some individuals. It does. So you can increase stability or, or control of the joints. You can increase torso stiffness for sure. But you're not doing it in a way that is that is optimal. And, and by optimal, I mean um, preserves the joints, has minimal internal forces, and still maximal stiffness or, or, or control stability. So it does work. But then I was lucky enough to take one of his classes and I said, you know, hey, doc, do you think it's important to integrate the diaphragm in this process with the abdominal wall? And he just said, without the diaphragm, there is no pressure. Without pressure, there is no stability. So he totally got it. And that's a, that's my favorite line because the diaphragm is so important. And, and Collage is the guy that kind of brought this into the limelight because it is the primary muscle that initiates this outward pushing force mm-hmm. against which the abdominal wall and the pelvic floor resist which results in intra-abdominal pressure. And another way to think about optimal stabilization is you're maximally leveraging intra-abdominal pressure and using the accessory muscles as little as possible. Um, another way that you can think about is you're maximally leveraging intra-abdominal pressure and using your spinal extensors as little as possible. Yeah. So the strategy that a lot of people use is they might pressurize, mm-hmm. but they also are just cranking their spinal extensors on usually before they pressurize. So that places this massive compressive load on the spine that they just walk around with 24 hours a day, whether they're squatting, whether they're laying in bed, watching TV, the back is constantly getting squished and that axial load creates injury to the disc. And if it's hyperextended, potentially to the facets, the bones in the back of the spine as well. So let's... Uh, kind of dial back and see. So when you were doing lower extremity lifts, when you were doing deadlift, deadlift squat, et cetera, at the end of the day, you would feel tightness and you would feel tightness in your extensor muscles of your back. Yep. Right? The back, a little bit in the glutes. Yep. So you were, one could say, over utilizing or utilizing at a very high percentage of your capacity, those muscles to stabilize your back. Correct. And one of the things that you've really changed in your programming now is really focusing on generating intra-abdominal pressure, expanding your core, and then utilizing that in order to create that brace so that now you can use those extensors as little as possible while still maintaining the optimum amount of stiffness in the spine. Correct. Is that right? Yeah, so you want, you need to pressurize first. So if you can't mm-hmm. pressurize, your brain is going to find a way to compensate. And the most common compensation, certainly in strength training, is an extension compression stabilizer training. Or it's an overactive posterior chain. Yeah. And most people in strength training love posterior chain stuff, which it's very important. Yeah. But yeah. when it becomes overactive, it overpowers the other muscles and, and distorts the posture and the spine. And then it creates that compression and that, that extension. Yeah. And so... Because of your ability to now use the abdominal wall a little bit better, I know there are a lot of people that every time they walk into the gym, they basically feel the need to put their weight belt on. 
I mean, they, yeah. even if they're like stretching their hamstrings, doing just mobility stuff, it's almost like they feel like they've got to put that weight belt on. They're right? doing preacher curls and they'll put the, <laughs> put the belt on. I've seen it. Yeah. And previously you kind of needed that weight belt. Almost. Uh, some people could almost be using it as a crutch to help stabilize their spine. It happened. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's gear in general. So any mm-hmm. sort of ergogenic aid, it's easy to slip into dependency. Yeah. Um, a weightlifting shoes, hook grip, knee sleeves, you know, whatever. There, there, there's a, a warm up routine. Smelling salts. Smelling, done yeah. that. You know. <laughs> um, I mean, all of those you can sort of fall into this habit where you're just gonna use more and more and more, right? Yeah. K- kinesio tape is another one, but I was never. I mean, I use them, but I tried to use them the, judiciously. The number of times I've kinesio taped my Achilles, it would astound you. I Yo, mean, I, I rolls, bet. Rolls of kinesio tape. Well, the, 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 this is a funny joke. There's a kid we're watching CrossFit 2012 regionals, and, and, you know, they're all just covered in it. Oh, yeah. And my buddy's just like, kinesio taping your whole body is like highlighting the entire page. <laughs> But anyway, so, you know, it's easy to slip into there and, like, become very dependent on the belt. So you Mm -hmm. start, oh, you know, I missed that that wrap. I'm going to put a belt on. And then you're like, ooh, okay, now it's going to be heavy. I'm going to put a belt on. And then it just keeps creeping. So you have sort of, like, equipment creep, so to speak, where then you're putting it on in warm-ups, where in reality you want to be using as little gear as possible unless your sport requires it. So if you're a power lifter, you need to know how to use a belt. Mm-hmm. Now, I still think you should use a belt for less than a third of your total sets in the year, but you definitely need to use a belt. If you're a soccer player, you could justifiably never use a belt because they can't use it in their sport. Mm-hmm. And so if you're going to use a belt, you're basically training them to stabilize in a way that they can't actually use in their sport. Yeah, so they, then can't, you, they can't walk onto the field. They can't put a belt on and, and have that. So you have to just think, like, do I really need to do this? Mm-hmm. Is that extra 10 pounds in the back squat yeah. worth the the belt or worth the risk or their back. Another reason that, so people use two belts for two reasons. One, they need the belt to improve their stiffness to get weight that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Mm-hmm. Two is their back is a little bit tweaky, doesn't feel great, and they want to do it so that they don't get injured, yeah. right? Okay, well, if you're a, a professional power lifter, then you have to learn how to use the belt because you need it in your sport. If you're a CrossFit athlete, even Olympic weightlifters, you can do it. Um, but if you're you know, an athlete that doesn't really need to be squatting super heavy or deadlifting super heavy. You just have to ask yourself, like, is is the juice worth the squeeze here? Yeah. And in many cases, the answer is no. So what I would do in those cases is either change the movement or I would just lighten the load and use what's called the repeated effort method as opposed to a max effort method. So if like we're working up to a heavy set of five and they look like garbage at three, I might just keep them that same weight or drop down and then like, all right, we're just going to hit, you know, or the third set is what I meant. The, you know, for the next, instead of doing two more sets, you're going to do three or four more sets, but you're going to do it at lighter weight. Mm -hmm. And that repetitive over, sorry, that um, repetitive movement that you're doing, it's not the same as going super heavy, but it still is very, very effective. And it doesn't come with the risk of going after a max set of five or triple or whatever. This program is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Always consult with your physician before starting any exercises or doing anything contained in this program. Always stop if you experience any pain, discomfort, or difficulties performing anything described in this program.